right, we are back on Chicago Hill. Uh, I'm LaShawn Ford, and we got Malika Gardner. And we got <laughs> Reven Fellows on. Reven Fellows. There he is. <laughs> so today, we, we're just going to get right into it. Sorry about any delays that may have happened. Today's focus is going to be on strong mental health. So before we begin, we want to include trigger warning that the topics we'll be discussing today will include references to self-harm and suicide. Your mental health and safety are our highest priority. So if you feel these topics may trigger you, please protect your mental health and well-being. Thank you so very much. And we'll go right to Reading Fellows for his opening. Uh, man, good evening, everybody. Um, just excited about the show, man, because Chicago Hill is definitely want to get the information out for not just to hear the conversation, but solutions. So, but I just want to add to uh, this topic brings to me a reminder of Phyllis Hyman who was a great entertainment was dealing with some of the similarities of depression and things of that nature also. And then uh, Sister Christy Williams, a friend of mine local who was crowned Miss uh, Cook County. And so I know it's a real tough place for those women in that profession. So I'm excited about hearing what we can talk about in terms of solution to help other people that may be having these conditions. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Brother Reven. And now Malika to introduce our guests. Yes, yes, I am. Uh, I feel honored. Uh, when when I saw them on the screen, I was like, oh, I should have did more with my hair, like got myself together. We, got... <laughs> <laughs> we have two beautiful women, but not just beautiful. I mean, their spirits are beautiful, what they're going to be talking about today. And they are badass, intelligent women. I, I'm like in awe. I was watching Erica Harold's videos. And I was like, Oh, this, this woman, she's, she's about it. She is about it. Absolutely love it. She is 2003 Miss America. And the woman is, I can't wait to play, play this clip um, of her in the competition. And she's also an attorney. So don't mess with her. Do <laughs> not mess with her. And then we have licensed professional counselor, Donna Tanner Harold, And we so need her today because the topic that we're going to be touching on, you know, I don't even know what to do with all those emotions. So I'm so glad that you're here today, Donna, to help us Thank you. through and help us to understand, you know, some of the things that uh, we go through, especially in, in our community, because we're not known for uh, taking the time to get help to to heal we don't make the time because we're always in survival mode to keep going so thank you so much for both of you all joining us today it's an honor thank you thank you for having me yes yes, yes. thank you and so we want to go um you want to do the uh, clip right now uh, Malika? yes titus delvin um if you want to run that first clip of erica so people have an idea of uh who we got with us today on chicago hill <laughs> yes we're excited to have you um erica and um our other special guests and so we have a clip before we begin the first round of tonight's miss america quiz i'm going to ask, ask each of our five finalists a question about their platform their commitment to community service remember miss america will spend the next year informing and educating america about this issue we've asked the ladies to keep their answers to 30 seconds we'll sound the chime when time is up ah it was cute. Let's begin with finalist number one, Miss Illinois, Erica Harold. Hey, Erica Harold. Hey, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Let's step up a little bit and look out. Your platform is empowering youth against violence. In a world where violence is so prevalent on TV and film, if you had a chance to address a group of entertainment executives, what would you say to them knowing that violence sells? I think it's a great question, and I would first and foremost explain to them that they have the power to change the culture of violence that is so pervasive in our country. We get tired of seeing Columbine, Santee, Jonesboro, where young people are become predators in their own classrooms, and I would challenge them as Miss America to change the culture of violence that we have and to start promoting entertainment medium that is more constructive and that's going to promote more, more better values for our society. Thank you very much. Please take your place at the podium. 
Miss Illinois. Yes. <laughs> Malika, bring what do back. You think, <laughs> Malika, you think um, she still has those same views? Let's hear from them. Uh, let's hear from <laughs> Erica and our other guests right now. Erica. Well, it's, it's an honor to be on this show today because what I love about what you're doing is you are having the conversations that we must be willing to have if we're going to empower people to be able to promote positive mental health. It's one thing to talk about it, but we have to be willing to have the conversations and take away the stigma. As Malika, you alluded to, so often within our communities in particular, there's this pressure to be Superman and Superwoman and to put on a facade of always having everything together. And we have to talk about the struggles that we face. We have to be transparent and we have to take away the stigma that a lot of people face when trying to deal with these serious issues of mental health and mental illness. So I just thank you for the platform that you provide every Saturday and for giving us this opportunity to join you in your conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And Donna? I agree with Eric. I think it's so important that as Black people and in this time when we are facing a lot of violence in our communities and across the country, that we begin to address it from a mental health viewpoint that we all have mental health and we all need to do what we can to take care of ourselves and one another. Mm -hmm. We have uh, one more clip to play. Um, Many of you have heard the story of Miss USA, Chesley Chris, um, who recently took her life. And, uh, you know, many of us are trying to wrap our brains around it because she was so beautiful and just her energy on the screen was just so vibrant. And so it was just a shock to so many. And um, I, it, it's, it's great that you both are here to give us uh, some insight into uh, depression because it can it can be hidden and, and we just don't see any signs of it. So uh, Titus, if you can play the next clip. Fantastic, kind, generous. She was just one of those rare people that had a heart for people. That's Chesley's grandfather, Gary Simpkins, remembering her with his first statement since her tragic death. To be extinguished so fast is just devastating. And you know that the only way you'll ever see them again is when you yourself pass away. We remember Chesley as funny, and as so many have said, a beacon of light. Great. Good. One of Chesley's mentors, Gail King, poured out her heart online in this new essay for Oprah Daily. There was something so special about that sparkle of a girl. Just in December, we sat down and had had lunch together and we said, isn't this great right before the holidays? Isn't this great after the first of the year, instead of Zoom, we can now start meeting in person. And we were very excited about that. I just genuinely, genuinely liked her and cared about her. Gail's CBS Mornings co-host, our former colleague, Nate Burleson also checked in. We were just looking at some old footage of you and Chesley in New York <laughs> shooting promos together. And it's just, it's funny, it's light. It's, it's just, a, it's a great sort of peek into the relationship that you had with her. She would walk into the room and she'd be on 10. You know, it's, it's almost like she was floating in. I'm gonna miss that girl, I really am. Hey y'all, I do a lot to make sure that I maintain my mental health. Though by all accounts, she seemed so in control, she did share some of her struggles, writing in Allure magazine in an essay last year. Turning 30 feels like a cold reminder that I'm running out of time to matter in society's eyes, and it's infuriating. And she had spoken with so many about their battles. Gabrielle, you've been so open and honest about, you know, some of the challenges you've had, your mental health, even suicidal thoughts. Chesley spoke with Gabrielle and her husband, Dwayne Wade, just last year. What do you say to someone at home who is feeling hopeless and just needs some encouragement? Take a lot more joy in the journey, but also therapy. Get it and, and have no shame about it. She talked with Mary J. Blige about the revelations that she made in her documentary, My Life. Most of the times I was just depressed and didn't want to live. You really went deep into mental health, which previously had a really big stigma around it, especially in the Black community. I had to show people where all this pain came from that was in the My Life album in the first place. And Taraji P. Henson shared her story about having suicidal thoughts in quarantine. I started having thoughts about ending it. Can you tell us how you were able to escape and how you stay positive now? 
Well, you know, you take each moment. It's not like I wake up every day and I'm happy, but thank God I'm in therapy. I can now identify when I'm about to start the tip down. <laughs> In 2020, Chesley spoke to the online edition of the collegiate newspaper, The Hilltop, for Mental Health Awareness Month. I try to set very clear boundaries, so even though I'm at home and I've got my computer and my phone with me, I'm done answering emails at 6 o'clock, um, and that helps me a lot. The then Miss Teen Universe DC, Madison Pina, now a junior journalism major at Howard University, appeared with Chesley. I want to make sure that Mental health is not frowned upon, but it is understood by students and teachers alike. And Madison, with me now, after you appeared with Chesley, did you form some kind of follow-up relationship with her? Yes, actually. It was so amazing to have her reach out for her to take that time and speak with me. It's really incredible to see that she was willing to respond. I have to imagine this left you devastated, stunned, and shocked like the rest of us. Um, how are you feeling right now? I will admit I had a complete and utter breakdown yesterday. Just hearing what happened as someone who really advocates for mental health, I just couldn't imagine what she was possibly going through it. And I'm just so saddened by this. If you are struggling and need help, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273. 8255. There was a clip, just a small clip. You know, um, mm. would you guys like to respond to that, Erica? You want to start by responding to what you heard there, and then we kick it to our therapist as well. Absolutely. I think so many people have been hit so hard by her death because from outside appearances, she did appear to have everything. She was beautiful. She was kind. She was incredibly accomplished. One of the things I want people to know about her is that before even becoming Miss USA, she was a lawyer and had her MBA. So she, this was a smart, brilliant woman. And we are used to seeing people struggle in ways that are apparent. And everyone talks about how she just seemed to be vibrant and dynamic. And to see someone like her die by suicide, it so shatters our impression of what mental illness is. It shatters our impression of how, pe how it presents. And for so many people, I think they could relate to aspects of her and aspects of her success and aspects of her, of her struggle. And I think many people and seeing the outpouring of tributes on social media, there was this sense of there was so much more that she had to offer and what a loss to everyone, including her, that we didn't get to see what the next chapters would look like. Mm. Yes, yes, indeed. Donna, um, did you want to respond to the um, clip that we shared? Well, generally speaking about depression, it's something that a lot of people can mask. I'm not really speaking necessarily to Chesley's situation, but just generally, People can mask the pain for a very, very long time. And it is important, and I think it is changing that Black people in particular are recognizing that we can't do it all. We can't continue to do it all every day because after a while, things just get too hard to bear. And the shame is lifting on reaching out and saying, I need help. I need someone to help me understand what I'm going through and to learn some coping skills that I don't know to deal with all the pressure and sometimes the unrealistic unreal pressures that we and other people put on each other. Mm. You know, um, I, I just recently um, heard an interview with the actress Lisa Nicole Carson. I don't know if you all remember her. She was in Love Jones and she played the attorney on uh, Ally McBeal, uh, if you all remember her. But uh, she dropped out of the scene um, some time ago because of depression and mental illness. And she said in this interview recently that a producer years ago on a film set uh, had told her that he saw signs of mental illness in her. So someone telling you that, that you barely know, of course, you're going to be insulted. Like, what are you saying? You know, but he said that she was on 10 always. She was happy all the time. So I think many of us are used to hearing, you know, or seeing, I, I know I've 
gone through depression when I was younger. And, um, you know, we hear people just crying out for help, you know, and they're actually saying I'm depressed. I, I can't snap out of it. Um, but we ignore the ones who are constantly always happy, like nothing phases them. And to me, when I see people like that, it does trigger something to me. Like, is there something wrong? Because you can't be happy all the time. Like what's going on? So do, I mean, are people starting to recognize even those who aren't appearing depressed, but those who are on 10 all the time, maybe is that a cry for help in a way? Is that something we should be paying attention to people who just aren't affected by anything? They just stay on 10 constantly. I think that we have to be aware that what we see isn't always the reality of someone's life. Mm -hmm. When we see people on Instagram and social media posting their accomplishments, that's not the totality of who they are. And we live in a society where people are sort of don't feel comfortable sharing their struggles. And so we're not going to see pictures of the day when somebody feels sad or somebody's not achieving or accomplishing. And so I think we have to first and foremost be aware of the fact that what we see of people isn't the totality of who they are. And we have to be proactive about reaching out to people and recognize we should reach out to the people who look like they're struggling, but we should also be reaching out to people who look like they're succeeding because we really don't have Mm. a good barometer of understanding what's reality and who really needs our help. Mm. Mm. I think it's important that during COVID, we all got disconnected from one another. We weren't in contact and there was a reluctance for anybody to say, I'm not doing well, because there was almost the pressure of being perfect. Oh, I'm going through COVID in this quarantine. I'm just fine. And that's really not realistic. So I think now as we move forward and out of COVID, it's imp- so important to reconnect. And if you see someone that doesn't, something doesn't ring true, that there could be something else, it's, it's important to explore, to dig a little bit deeper. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, wh- so wh- definitely wh- that could be a sign that things aren't perfect because perfection is unattainable. So mm-hmm. if someone is reaching for that level. Yeah, that could be a sign, that not necessarily depression, but something is going on that someone needs to check in with. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's they have a few questions, but do you think we place too much pressure on ourselves and others to be successful? I mean, you think about it. I mean, there is probably a lot of pressure. Once you enter the arena and say that you were going to be Miss America, Miss USA, now you set yourself up for a lot of pressure. So no matter what we do, right, Erica, it's going to be um, pressure. It's, it's a lot of pressure. And speaking from my own experience, after I became Miss America, the question people would always ask me, well, what's next? What's next? And you feel like you always have to find ways of sort of topping yourself. And when you win a national title when you're really young, there's re- there really aren't that many things that you're going to accomplish that are going to be of a national scope right away at least. And so there's this sense that unless you have some answer that will impress people, that that's not good enough. And in reading Chesley's essay that she wrote in Allure, I could see that she was experiencing those same sorts of struggles where you feel that people love you and care about you because of your accomplishments and because of your titles. And if you don't have a good answer to what's next, that you feel as if somehow you're disappointing people. So obviously setting goals and reaching towards success is healthy, but we can't define people in that way. And I think we need to start asking people questions that get more to caring about who they are as opposed to what they're going to accomplish. So let's not always ask people what's next. It's how are you? Or, you know, what have you accomplished? Tell me, are you doing, are you working on a project that's interesting and meaningful to you? Let's try to have conversations that really open the door for people to share what's going on in their life, as opposed to putting on a facade of perfection. Yeah. You know, one of the things that, you know, we talk about on Chicago Hill is many people are going through struggles, if not all, it's just how you deal with it. I think that we shine a light on um, Chesley because we know that there are people listening 
and people that were not uh, Miss America, Miss USA, but they work every day in the struggle. And so we, we do this because we don't want her life to be and death to be in vain. We should make sure that her life and death is helpful so that no one else has to um, have the struggle and, and do it in darkness. You know, Erica, if you could just tell us why her win uh, viewed, it was viewed as such a historic win. One of the things that was very significant about her win is in 2019, it was the first year that all of the major pageant titles were held by Black women. So Miss America, Miss USA, and Miss Teen USA, those were all Black women. And one of the reasons why that's so significant is there was a time in which to compete in those pageants, at Miss America, for example, you had to certify that you were completely white and did not have a drop of Black blood. And there were times when women were competing competing and their natural authentic features were held against them. And so many women of color struggle with this sense that their features are not being viewed as beautiful or good enough and there's pressure to modify. So in 2019, to see all of the major titles being held by black women, it really gave visible proof to the notion of black is beautiful and you are enough and you should be celebrated in who you are. And she had the ability to make a lot of appearances and be a role model to so many young women. And I think that's why her story has so gutted so many people because they saw themselves in her. She won also with her natural curl pattern. And I'm sure she faced sort of temptation or pressure to change that, but she went on stage authentically as who she was and she won. And so for little girls whose hair looked like her, whose skin looked like her, all of a sudden they saw someone who they could say, she looks like me, maybe I'm enough as well. Hmm. Oh, that's great because we have, I don't know if you know her, but uh, Reven, Reven, you also talked about um, Christina, Christy Williams. She was the Miss Cook County and she wears her hair natural. Is that right, Reven? Yes, sir. And uh, she's been a great champion. Uh, I've watched her as a mom. And so I thought fitting that her getting that award and doing what she's achieved in the academic and being a single mom, I'm sure she faced some of those challenges. So I'm glad, I'm very proud of her and watched her grow. I think she she knows firsthand uh, the struggles of trying to maintain. You know, most Black women trying to get it all done. So I really commend her for really standing and getting that honor. You know, there's a lot more questions that we're going to have on mental and behavior health so that people could be strengthened. But let's go lighter just a little bit. Tell the Well, listener. I want to get a little deeper. You want to get deeper? We can get a little deeper. So, uh, all right, let's get deeper because I want I want people to get ready for Erica to tell them how to prepare for all the pageants. What can they get into? But go deeper, Malika. Malika, yeah, I, fun. I, I, yeah, yeah, because yeah. So, <laughs> so Donna, with with Chesley taking her life in that way, and you had so many women and young girls really looking up to her and watching her. And like Erica said, um, seeing themselves in her and she was inspiring. I mean, we were all celebrating when it was Miss, Miss America, Miss U USA. I mean, we, we were like, yes, like all black, weren't we? Erica, we were like, yes, yes. It, we it, were. it was our year to shine. <laughs> yes. Yes. So then for Chesley to, I mean, I mean, taking her life, especially in the way that she did was just, whoa, you know, so what do you, what do you say to young girls who were, who are looking up to her and still seeing themselves in her? Like what, what, how do you explain, what do you say to young girls now after what has happened? I would say, and I'm going to tie this to a little bit about what you talked about, about success. Um, in every way, Chesley seemed to be overwhelmingly successful, and that was success for her. But each one, particularly this is for young people, we have to find, young people have to find their path to success, and we have to allow them to define it on their terms. They don't have to be an NFL player. They don't have to be a beauty queen. We can learn to accept and to rejoice with people who work 
a regular job and take care of their kids who are responsible, honest people. Because again, I think the pressure of being successful and what that means just adds to mental health struggles. Mm. Mm. I think, I know a lot of young people that I've talked to when they tell me about, they wanna be successful, they wanna make something of themselves. I ask them, what does that mean to you? How would that look? What do you hope to accomplish in your life? Because I want them to get a sense of value that it doesn't, you don't have to compare yourself. You don't have to be like someone else. You can be happy and fulfilled in the life that you make for yourself. We have some callers. Um, let's go to caller number one. You have 30 seconds, so then we get back to um, the discussion. Caller, you're on the air at Chicago Hill. Uh, yeah. Are you talking to me? Yes. Go right ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Is that uh, Sister Erica uh, on with you, uh, Sean? It is. If it's Erica Harrell, is that who you are referring to? Yes. 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 It's yes. me. <laughs> yeah, okay. Say your name. I don't see your name, so she knows. <laughs> Well, let me just tell you who I am. First of all, let me thank you guys for Chicago Hill. You know, that this, this show means so much to our community, and I just urge you, uh, Rep Ford, keep up the good work, you and Sister Malika and, and Brother Rivas. This is Brother Hall, Erica. Hello, how are you? Oh, I'm doing well. Let me just remind you who I am. I'm the brother that helped put the ship together for you out in Riverside with the Moy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again. And thank you for connecting with us. Uh, no, no question. No question. Listen, I just wanted to say thank you for being the sister who you are and down to earth. You know, you, you, we, we, we really, really respect that. I know I do. And I just was so glad and thrilled to be in your presence. And listen, uh, I'm going to leave my number with the uh, with the uh, screener. And we need to make a connection on, on another issue. Would you uh, see, can you reach out to me? Absolutely. And thank you for those kind words. It really means a lot to me. And absolutely, we'll connect on any issue. Okay, thank then. You. And I'll make sure she gets your number. Um, thank you, Brother Hall. Let's go to Frank. You're on Chicago Hill. Frank, you're on Chicago okay. Hill. Okay, thank you. I, I blew my brother, so how y'all doing? Very good. Okay. Thanks for calling. Great, great show. And let me say, I second everything Brother Hall just said. Uh, listen, um, I'm going to break it out like this. Um, this us try to what happens to this system. But I'm afraid, I'm, I'm concerned that we're jumping too, we may be jumping too quickly to, to categorize this up on, as a mental illness. Seeing how educated she was and how much she has offered, how much she accomplished. Nine years old and 10 years old. I attempted to commit suicide uh, up on the same umbrella right here. Um, the point I'm trying to make just right here, especially when we're doing with our young ladies, okay? We overlooking something I think is very important that can also cause a young person to want to commit suicide. It has to do with mental illness. What so hold on, hold on, Frank. You make a strong, strong point. I know you went kind of fast. So you want to separate mental illness from suicide. I want to. I want to say. Yeah, I want to say it may not always be mental illness. Okay. There's something just as strong out there, even maybe even stronger. Can we can we put yeah. a pin in there and let Donna answer? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I I think the caller is correct that it is unwise to categorize all suicide as a result of mental illness. That's absolutely not right. true. Most people who die by suicide don't necessarily want to die, they want to end their pain. And there you go. And there's yeah. a difference. And so that's not a, and yeah. pain is pain. And the thing about suicide is that there are far more questions that are left for the survivors than answers, answers that you'll never get. Even if people leave notes, there's still nothing there. You weren't there, you didn't work with them every day to understand what they were going through through and then why they came to that decision. So that call is absolutely correct. It's not, suicide is not always a result of mental illness. And there's a difference between mental illness and mental health. Thank you so very much, Frank. Mm. That was very good, Frank. Thank you. You want to close out with something? All right, Frank, thank you for calling Chicago Hill. Let's go to Jay, you're on Chicago Hill. Yes, um, thanks for taking my call. Um, what you just spoke about 
kind of led into um, what I want to speak on at this moment. Um, sometimes um, people are, are embarrassed and pushed into um, a suicide. Um, the, the, the people play mental games with them, and that individual may not know how to deal with that issue. Um, Martin Luther King was tried. To, they tried to embarrass him. And to embarrass him, um, they tried to embarrass him into committing suicide, and he wouldn't do it because um, he's mentally strong. So uh, um, this this lady could have uh, been going through something that uh, we are not aware of. I never even heard of her. I I, I just started watching TV, so I, I've never even seen her on television. You know. Um, she could have been pushed into something. Some of these organizations, these Eastern Stars, these Masons, um, they they they, they want to embarrass you and break you down and then build you up, you know. And some people have a difficult time with that, you know. And maybe there was something that someone knew about her, and they were, you know, going to expose her or something, and she couldn't take it, you know. So. Oh. That's very true. Definitely hit on something right there. And thank you so much for that, Jay. Michelle, you're on Chicago Hill. You know, I want to thank you and uh, Brother Reeve and specifically on this one because there are layers of support we all need. I don't care whether you have fame or, or, or you are hiding somewhere and under a rock. Everybody needs layers of support. And I want to thank Brother Reeves specifically because Miss Erica Harrell has those layers of support I see coming through Brother Reeves. That's why she called in today, I believe. And then lastly, I wanted to say, has anybody considered the possibility that media wants us to focus on a suicide when it could have been an assassination, a murder? With intent, mm. with, on, with intent to boost mm -hmm. the suicide watch for the money. I mean, you know, we see a lot of this. And also for the shame of three black women winning in all categories. They had mm -hmm. to do something to take us down because we were rising. You know what I'm saying? Has anybody looked into the investigation of Michael Scott? for instance. Ain't no way in the world he shot himself with his hands tied behind his back and threw himself over in the river. Well, you know what I'm you. saying? It's thank those you. kinds of things that we just take for granted because media says it. So yeah, what Michelle is saying that we, 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 right we got to make sure that we don't push, um, push the um, suicide because the press is saying it that we have to make sure that we um, look at whether or not there's some foul play. But let's go right to uh, Erica. Once again, tell them who you are and and um, the strength that you have and where it comes from. That Go ahead, Erica. Well, one of the things that I would want people to know is that I had an incredible support system growing up. I had incredible parents. My mother, as you can tell right here, if you get to have someone like her as, as your mother, you have somebody who's your biggest cheerleader. Part of m maintaining positive mental health for me was my faith. It helped me to have an identity that wasn't just about achievement, this sense that I had eternal value. And I believe that for every single person who is listening today. And what I would encourage every person who's listening is to recognize you are enough and you do matter. You don't have to be famous. You don't have to win titles. Your mental health matters and you matter to each and every one of us. And if you are having any kind of struggles, please do reach out and seek help because we want you here. Your life matters. And for any young person who's trying to find encouragement right now, do recognize that life right now is really tough for a lot of people. And if you're struggling, don't feel bad. We are in a pandemic. 
There are people struggling with all sorts of issues, but things are going to get better. Keep setting goals for yourself. Keep believing in yourself and do not believe the negative things that other people may say about you because you have a worth that is separate and apart from what anyone may say about you or what you may accomplish. I think that we should also talk to Donna. Um, that's your daughter. So you got her head on, right? That's very good. Um, <laughs> Uh, what, could you just tell us what um, can people do to try to sustain that positive mental health? Because many times people go to the health club and they think that they're, you just want to be physically strong, but we have to be physically, mentally, and spiritually strong. What's your recommendation as a therapist on how people can sustain that positive mental health? Well, thank you for recognizing that we have different dimensions. We have a physical health and we know the things primarily to do to promote that, to exercise, to eat well, to get good sleep. And those things are important for mental health as well, because we all have a level of mental health. We all do, just like we all have a level of physical health. And some of the things that, that people can do on an everyday basis is to recognize when you are struggling, when you need to reach out and, and do the, some of the same things, eating well, resting, taking time to relax, realizing that you don't have to go 24-7 that you need to take some time out to take a, take a hot bath, to speak with a friend, take a long walk. It's so important to get outside every day to connect with the sun. It just lifts the important chemicals in our brain that feed positive energy and positive emotions. Um, another thing that people can do is have fun. Have fun, as, especially as we get older, we just drive ourselves. A couple of years ago, I took a tap dancing class and it was a lot of fun. I, not, I got good at it. I, I did not, but it was a lot of fun. And, and it, exercising is important because it releases energy. It releases some of the frustrations. Get a massage. The, the main thing to recognize is that we have to take care of our mental health. Be around positive people, people who encourage you. And then kind of disengage. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's family members who tend to to not be encouraged, you know, tend to find the negative things only in you. So I think it's as we're coming into a new age of recognizing how important our mental health is and how we can strengthen that and maintain it, I think we're all better off. You know, one of, think, yeah, one of the things Malika always says is that people, for instance, we've had Nathan, he's on the show and he lost his daughter to gun violence. Hmm. Baby was shot in the head. And Malika, our interview with him, he said he was back to work in two days. In two and days. Malika is always saying that, you know, that we just don't what, Malika? We don't take the time. We don't take, we don't think we, we have the time. And I always share, we've had, you know, many deaths in our family, murders actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, a therapist had told my mother when I was younger, you all haven't taken time to grieve and mourn. And my mother's like, I have two children. I'm a single mother. I've lost both my husbands. You know, I have to go to work. I, I, I don't have, when do I have time for, for healing or, or therapy? And um, it's, it's interesting now because she's a life coach. So she, she definitely promotes it um, to take that time. But yeah, I, I would say mainly in our community, because a lot of the trauma that happens in the black community, we've come to normalize it. So we just get up and go to work. We just keep going. We just keep I, going. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I say a word about grieving? Yes. Because yes, so many please. in the black community, we grieve a lot. We have a lot of losses and you mm -hmm. may not have time to take two or three weeks away, but you have to understand the grieving is a process. It's going to take time and there is no time limit. There is no right or wrong way of grieving. What works for one person may not work for another person. And, and there's stages of grief. There's anger, there's bargaining. There's just incredible sometimes sadness. So you're not supposed to be all right in a couple of days. And that's, and we have to be understanding of people who are grieving that they'll have good days and they'll have bad days. And it will come, it's a long time before people actually come to the stage of accepting the loss. What does they it look like for it? a person to, to take time, to, to take some time for their healing? Well, one thing that they can do to help their healing is it's okay to talk about the person you lost. Because sometimes people are a little bit 
nervous about it and they think it might make you feel bad, but it actually encourages the person who has lost someone that someone else is, is thinking of them and reminding them that their life mattered. You mm. may have lost your son and it he's does. gone now, but the things that he did were important and we need to continue to honor him. Sometimes families have a tradition of honoring that person in a formal way on their birthday or on anniversaries or at Christmas time with an ornament. There's lots of things that people can do to help keep that person memory alive and it's not dysfunctional actually it's very healing to do those things yeah so with that said uh, you want to give some advice on what um, we can do to better support people who are facing mental health challenges and while you're preparing this statement we want to share the national suicide prevention hotline number is 1-800-273-8255 and if you need someone to talk to the Illinois Department of Public Health, you can text TALK to 55-2020. Um, so, uh, Donna, you want to tell us what can we do to better support people who are facing mental health challenges? Well, mental health challenges, that's a broad topic, but let's just say someone is struggling and they may not even know exactly the cause. It may be depression, it may be anxiety. The best thing that you can do is to be supportive, is to listen. If they want to talk, let them talk. I am a counselor and I see people and a lot of times they say to me, thank you, you've been so helpful. And what I've done most is just listen. And listening means really, really listening, engaging with the person, not talking. They don't need you to talk. They need someone to help them, to really help them process what they're going through. So being there for them, sometimes it's just sitting with people, a physical presence to let them know that they're not alone. If there are physical things that you could do, preparing a meal, taking care of their children so that they can have time to to be alone or to spend some time just doing something that that promotes their health. So those are some simple ways that don't cost a lot. They don't cost anything. They just cost our time. And what people need most when they're suffering or they're going through something, and we all go through something at some point in our lives, we all do. We need someone to know that they're there, that they're not judgmental that they're not looking at us like something is wrong because it's a very natural, normal part of life to go through things and not always make it look easy. Yeah, so Don, we're going running short on time. We wanna ask one final question of Erica. What advice would you have for young women who are considering competing in pageants and wanna protect their mental health? And if you could just tell how many pageants there are that they could possibly be um, competing for. That was like a ton. Yeah. There, there are a lot of pageants you could compete in. And I would be the first to say competing is not for everyone because while there are opportunities and scholarship money that you may attain, I mean, that was my motivation to enter. I was able to pay for law school in its entirety through competing in the Miss America organization. And so there are positives that you can attain, but the reality is there are negative consequences as well. There are a lot of people who are gonna give you negative feedback. There are people on social media who are going to say negative things about you. That's something that Chesley alluded to in her essay. So what I would say is if you're interested in competing, first and foremost, ask yourself, what is the tangible goal that I hope to gain from this experience? If it's validation from other people or recognition, I would say that's the wrong motivation because you're going to find far more negative feedback from other people, and that may be difficult to deal with. If, however, you're interested in getting scholarship money, speaking opportunities, that's a good motivation to go into it. And then set up some real ground rules for yourself of how you're going to protect yourself. Set rules for who can interact with you. If people say crazy things to you in terms of feedback of lose this amount of weight, change this hair color, be willing to stand up for yourself and your own individuality. I would also say on social media, use the mute button, mute people who say negative things to you. We do not have an obligation to take in everyone's negative opinion about ourselves. That's part of us setting up healthy boundaries to be able to be successful. And the final thing I would say is be willing to share your story. 
when I was Miss America, my platform was preventing youth violence and prevention because I was the victim of severe bullying when I was in high school and had to change high schools. And so I used my platform to show that even if you're Miss America, you can have been somebody that was targeted, discriminated against, and sort of persecuted by classmates. Be willing to tell your story, be willing to have a purpose so that your crown and experience can extend beyond just your own personal life. Thank you so very much, Erica and Donna, for your contributions to Chicago Hill. Reem, you want to give your closing? We have um, 10 seconds. <laughs> now, I just want to say to those women, stay encouraged. There's a lot of strong women in the Bible. And if you look at the uh, Sojourner Truth, out of be well, look at them and then take from their strength during that time. And I think they can really have a historical content of the trials and tribulations that they may face and to be successful and encouraged. Thank you. Thank you. Donna, you want to give a, a 10 second closing? I really appreciate you having me on today along with Erica. I think it's so important that we talk about this and we talk about it in an open and honest way and answer questions and not be afraid to realize that we're not perfect. We all need help at some point and we have to learn how to do that and how to better take care of ourselves. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. And Malika. Thank you so much to Erica and to Donna. Thank you. Thank you for all the knowledge and wisdom and the passion, compassion that you've given to our listeners today. And my word is I'm definitely about faith. Faith, faith is everything. If you have that solid foundation in your faith, you can get through anything, absolutely anything. And um, Chicago Hill is always here for you. The door is always open. And we all have a legacy that we want to uh, achieve and leave. Share um, the hotline with other people, 1-800-273-8255. That's the National Suicide Prevention Hotline in Illinois Department of Public Health. Please text TALK to 55-2020. This has been another episode of Chicago Hill with LaShawn Ford, Malika Gardner, and Reven Fellows, and our special guests, Erica and Donna. Thank you very much. See you guys next week. <laughs>